Welcome back to Best of the Day from the 55th Annual Meeting of the American Society of Hematology. We're talking about multiple myeloma this morning with Dr. Ken Anderson from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So Ken, thanks again for being here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about maintenance and then we'll move on and talk about some of the studies in relapsed disease. But the, uh, the MM015 uh, trial really got a lot of talk going on about maintenance with MPR followed by uh, prolonged administration of lenalidomide. And, and there have been a number of other studies using uh, interferon for maintenance, using thalidomide or prednisone or thalidomide and prednisone. But this MMO15 trial really got everyone thinking about long-term continuation therapy with agents like lenalidomide. And then a year later or so in Orlando, there was the question of secondary um, malignancies about whether there were solid mm -hmm. tumors or, or hemologic malignancies. And we talked a little bit about that earlier. So um, Michelle Attal uh, presented some follow-up of, of the French trial looking at uh, long-term lenalidomide following stem cell transplant. And then Dr. Singh from Mayo Clinic uh, presented a meta-analysis of, of maintenance trials. So where do things stand in, in what we may no longer call maintenance or more continuation therapy, both, right. both in the transplant eligible population and in the older ineligible population? Right. Now, I think one of the major messages at, from ASH this year is that of continuous therapy. Now, that is uh, another uh, disguised uh, term for maintenance therapy. Uh, but the message is strong, uh, Jim, whether it's in the elderly population or whether it's in the transplant population, that the use of uh, lenalidomide in particular has, uh, in the majority of cases, prolonged progression free and overall survival. So what we had here was, for example, in the 015 experience of Antonio Palumbo's that you referred to, mm -hmm. they have a new parameter where they actually measure the uh, impact of the salvage therapy. Mm -hmm. So the time to progression after the first salvage therapy. In so doing, from, from uh, early on, and in so doing, to determining and making sure that you, by, by using maintenance, we haven't created a more aggressive we relapse. We haven't burned any bridges. Right. So in that uh, analysis that was presented here, uh, lenalidomide came out very favorably. There was not a more aggressive relapse created. Um, the, um, in the transplant experience, as you know, the CALGB uh, experience, which I and many other investigators were involved with, uh, continues to show with more follow-up that continuous uh, lenalidomide post-autologous transplant is extending progression free and overall survival. Um, the meta-analysis that you referred to uh, was from Dr. Singh at the Mayo Clinic, and they haven't always been the biggest cheerleaders for maintenance right. at the Mayo yeah. Clinic. Uh, but they looked or uh, at each of these studies, Jim, they put the 015 and the other trials in the non-transplant candidates, they put the CLGB and the French trial together and others. Um, there is a large trial, uh, for example, that I'll just quickly mention it was here, that Antonio uh, Palumbo again did where he did lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and he randomized to either lenalidomide, melphalan, prednisone, or to transplant. And in each arm, he then randomized whether it was transplant or MPR to lenalidomide or not maintenance. And that trial's very positive again, no matter whether you got the transplant or MPR. In each case, lenalidomide maintenance, prolonged progression free and overall survival. So back to the ranch, Dr. Singh did all of the trials in a meta-analysis. So he took all of the data from these trials, transplant and not, and it is real. The progression free and overall survival is real. Now, Michelle Attal created a little bit of controversy here. He right. is not unknown for doing that, actually, <laughs> and take some pride, in my view, <laughs> in doing it. Uh, and he's one of my dear friends with whom we collaborate on big trials. Uh, so the IFM um, ought to be congratulated. But in fact, um, what he said was that in his trial, you know, he's seen a progression-free survival doubling 
by using lenalidomide continuous, but he hasn't seen any overall survival advantage. If we take two steps backwards and think about why that might be the case, uh, it is, in fact, uh, likely, in my opinion, that he didn't use continuous <laughs> lenalidomide therapy. They actually stopped, what has been said is they actually stopped at two years of lenalidomide maintenance. When you actually look at the data, the patients primarily got three years of lenalidomide maintenance. But the point is, they didn't get continuous therapy. So the problem, in my view, is that after they stopped the lenalidomide maintenance, they have now seen more relapses than mm -hmm. they would have been seen if they hadn't. So, Is there any concern um, regarding continuation therapy with agents like lenalidomide in the patients who have received alkylators as opposed to those who've received proteasome inhibitors or, or other imits? Yeah, I think there probably is. The, the, what's inherent here, and it may not be that all alkylators are the same mm -hmm. either, but what I think we know, and this is known for a long time, is low-dose melphalan, melphalan prednisone based regimen, high-dose melphalan as in transplant. In either case, no imids anywhere to be seen, there is an inherent increased risk of secondary cancers. The question is, if imids are now in the picture, do they add to that risk or not? And it is likely that they slightly increase that risk. What is exciting, and it's more evidence that this meeting, right, mm -hmm. is the first trial that we've talked about previously, right. but this big 1,600 patient trial that showed that lenalidomide dexamethasone in the elderly was superior in terms of response rate and X frequency and PFSOS, superior to MPT, actually had fewer attendant secondary right. blood cancers. So. I don't know if the world uh, ultimately will evolve away from melphalan for this reason. Um, we, as you know, are looking at RVD with or without transplants, so with right. or without high-dose melphalan. Mm -hmm. I suspect, as we've talked earlier here, that lenalidomide dex will be more commonly used in the elderly and melphalan won't be. The one thing I would tell you is that the cytoxan, even though it's an alkylator, doesn't appear to have right. the same attendant secondary cancer risk as melphalan. Right, not nearly as damaging to the stem cells. Right. Very good. All right, that's interesting. Um, well, let's go on and talk a little bit about uh, relapse disease. There was a final analysis of the MMO3 trial. This was the POM low-dose dex versus high-dose dex. Um, and that trial, of course, was very positive as far as progression-free survival and, and somewhat with overall survival. But they looked at um, high-risk patients cytogenetically versus standard risk. Is there much of a difference between those two populations? Yeah, I think the, the, the trial that you referred to, and it was Thanos Demopoulos was the right. leader from Greece, but it was a primarily European trial, randomized high-dose dex versus palm low-dose dex in relapse refractory disease. Very positive trial. It is the trial that was used for EMEA to approve pomalidomide low-dose mm -hmm. dex, and it's approved in Europe now for relapse disease, so not just relapse refractory, right. relapse disease. But the only new thing here, they have obviously further follow-up, but the main new thing is that even if you look in high-risk cytogenetics, and the most high-risk we know of right now is the 17P deletion. Right. Um, it does appear that their uh, POM low-dose dex regimen is effective in it's that effective. population. And so then POM dex has also been combined with carfilzomib, this carpom d regimen. Um, how well is that combination tolerated, and does that seem to um, you know, augment the, yeah. uh, the benefit? Because that, that's like switching to the agents in the RVD regimen, the lenalidomide in mm. the bortezomib and putting carfilzomib and pomalidomide in there. Right. Um, what, what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, no, I think it, I think, uh, it is well uh, tolerated and very active. So what, in, in terms of the combinations, mm. right, of the uh, POM low dose dex, um, the two things are being done. So bortezomib or Velcade is being combined with POM dex. Right. And there were two experiences reported here, one from my colleague Paul Richardson 
and one from uh, the Mayo Clinic with Joe McHale. Mm -hmm. But in both cases, um, bortezomib palm dex re achieved response rates of 70 to 80 percent in relapsed multiple myeloma. The registration trial, full registration trial for palm low-dose dex is actually palm low-dose dex bortezomib versus bortezomib dex. Right. Um, now, you're at the trial you mentioned, Carl Filzomib pomalidomide dex, uh, Jatin Shah and his colleagues. Or MD Anderson or Yeah. Something. They reported that uh, it's a response rate of about 70 percent. And it's, so that's quite remarkable. But, you know, palm dex in this setting would be by itself maybe 30 or 40 percent. Carl Filzomib by itself probably 20 or 25 percent. And what you're hearing is it's at least additive. Um, right, and these are relapsed refractory patients, mm -hmm. not upfront right. treatment. Right. So I think the it's uh, again the principle of putting a proteasome inhibitor mm -hmm. together with an imid is absolutely uh, sound biologically and clinically. But as you correctly said, what about combining the second generation, oh, right. each of which is more potent? And I do think we have a more potent uh, combination. So all variations on a theme. Right, but, it, but a very positive theme, right? All right, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, we're talking about proteasome inhibitors, let's talk about some of the more novel investigational agents. There are a number of oral proteasome inhibitors in, in the pipeline, including uh, Millennium's drug MLN 9708, or what's now, I believe, called Ixazomib. Right. Um, and I know Paul Richardson has, has looked at that, and uh, Shaji Kumar from the Mayo Clinic has presented some data. How is that agent moving along in, as a single agent or in combinations? Yeah, so we're um, very excited about um, exazomib. Uh, patients, I think, are very excited about exazomib. So it's the son of bortezomib. It's a boronic-based but right. oral proteasome inhibitor. So it's another reversible inhibitor. Right, right, boronic-based reversible chymotryptic inhibitor. Half-life uh, is three to four days, so Paul Richardson reported here on using twice a week exazomib with lenalidomide dexamethasone as initial therapy. Shaji reported here, Dr. Kumar at the Mayo Clinic reported on a multi-center trial of using the single agent uh, exazomib in more advanced patients. So let me mention the latter first. Um, he had a response rate in the order of around 20% or so to single agent uh, exazomib with a large fraction of patients, uh, another half of the patients having stable disease. So a lot of people having benefit from the single agent. And it did, inc it did include some patients whose myeloma was resistant to bortezomib. But honestly, that um, isn't the way it's going forward. Uh, exazomib is being combined with lenalidomide dexamethasone and the, it's being compared to lenalidomide dexamethasone in a large randomized phase three trial for approval. So this will be the RID regimen to get rid of myeloma? I like that. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we can't get that introduced and we'll definitely give you credit. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> No, so anyway, it's exciting in the in the relapse setting, uh, Jim. But it's even more in the initial. It's it's like the Red Sox going from last to first. Okay, now let's no. not talk about the Red Sox and the Cardinals. That's okay. a sensitive area. You know what else we can't <laughs> talk about is the Super Bowl that occurred in this city in two thousand one. Do you remember? In no. two thousand one and nine eleven, we had a terrible event in oh, our yeah. country. Just a few months later, the lowly New England Patriots came to this city to pay the mighty St. Louis Rams. And oh, yes. We were very underdogs, and you know what happened. That's right, yeah. As that's we like right. to say in New England, everybody was a patriot then. Yeah, day. that's for sure. <laughs> so, anyway. That's for you. Well, the Red Sox were also the sweetheart this year after I the, uh, the event at the, at the uh, marathon. The marathon, yes. right. Yes. Anyway, you know, as I, you and I have talked for many, many years when it comes to myeloma or cancer, but myeloma for us, we're all on the same team. So, Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Um, but it is fun. Um, I think the issue here, so back to, to uh, the MLN 9708 drug, but if you use it up front with uh, lenalidomide dex, Paul, my colleague, reported it's way up there, 93% response rate. And there was a concern that maybe the extent of responses might not be as good as with the IV proteasome inhibitors. 
it isn't going to be a concern. They, over time, they do get the very high frequency of complete, near complete, et cetera, responses. I think the kinetics of response is, is different. Mm -hmm. It just simply takes longer to get to uh, over time. Uh, the area under the curve is, is um, greater. Uh, because of the continuous dosing. Yeah. yeah. But mm -hmm. the way it's going forward, Paul uh, Richardson did the twice a week oral mm -hmm. regimen. Uh, Shaji Kumar did with Lendex once a week um, exazomib in newly diagnosed patients. And honestly, the way it's going forward in both populations, relapse and upfront is once a week. Once a week. That will be great. Well, yep. we'll, we'll end this session and come back in just a minute and talk about some of the novel agents, especially the antibodies. So stay with us. We'll be back shortly and we'll talk about some of the exciting new agents for our multiple myeloma.